Well, howdy, everybody. Time for the Facebook Friday Q&A. This should be fun, shouldn't it? Let's hope so. As I scroll through these questions, I'm sure I'm going to get lots of CM Punk questions, so I'll address that here in a moment. Uh, Brandon Harding kicks us off, though, with it looks like a non-CM Punk question. The other big topic of the week, I suppose, is Sting. Okay, now Sting has finally stepped inside a WWE ring. Who is the best wrestler to not ever step inside of a WWE ring? Oh, man. That's a really, really, really good question. Does this person necessarily have to be living? Um, hmm. Best person to never step inside a WWE ring. Hmm. Kind of drawing a blank here. If I went way back in the day, I can't remember or recall a time where Lou Thez ever did anything with the old WWF. Um, so that might be one. I can't remember off the top of my head whether Vern Gagne ever did anything. Uh, he might have worked the garden as a part of a WWF car, but I'm not sure if he was a part of the actual WWF show. There's going to be a couple of guys that could stand out to me. i got to go historical here because I'm not sure about in terms of uh, some of these other guys. Uh, best kind of like active or modern wrestler. I mean, we're not talking necessarily about the guys that did dark sh dark matches for WWE years back. Um, you know, somebody in TNA that I always wonder how they do in WWE would be Bobby Roode. And that'd be somebody right there. Um, maybe in Austin Aries, but I'd say maybe more so Bobby Roode would be a better built for success in that company. Uh, Brad Jaminet. Well, I might as well ask because everyone is going to ask this, probably. What do you think about CM Punk's interview with Colt Cabana? You want to know what I think about it? You're just going to have to wait until I do a video about it. It's the best thing I'm going to tell you at this time. It was somewhat insightful. Not all that surprising. I don't know if it changed my perspective about things one way or another or not. The only way you're going to know ultimately is to tune in this weekend when I do uh, record a video and talk about it a little bit. Why not? Uh, Ryan Smith, out of three, which do you think could main event a WrestleMania 31? Sting versus Triple H, Reigns versus Cena for the title, or Brock versus Rock? I don't think Sting versus Triple H would be what they would classify as main event, close the show, WrestleMania worthy. It might be that middle of the card monster match. It might even go into that semi main event role right before the main event. Um, Brock versus Rock would be a possibility, although I don't think they're going to go there. I'd almost say they might do Brock and Batista. Uh, so at this point, I'd probably say my money would be on Reigns versus Cena for the title. I think it might be the way they need to go if they decide that that's where they want to go with Reigns at the Royal Rumble. I'm not saying at this moment that I necessarily fully agree with that. But if you do, and that's where you need to go, and if you feel that's right for you and where you want to go, then so be it. And if I'm doing that, then I want to make sure Reigns is taking that title off of Cena, not Brock, for reasons that I've previously mentioned and explained in great detail. Patrick Small, had Bischoff and his group been able to buy WCW in 2001? Reportedly, the plan was to go off TV for a few months and return with a new look and direction. How successful do you think this WCW could have been? Uh, frankly, if they'd been able to buy it, but they didn't have any television, would have done no fucking good. That's always one of those, Patrick, one of those woulda, coulda, shoulda, that sounds great in theory. But again, the problem is, if they didn't have television through Turner, the brand was practically worthless. So when everybody talks about Vince bought, bought it for you know, four and a half, five million dollars, whatever he bought WCW for, he was basically buying the name and the video library. And that was it. It still ended up being a tremendous investment. But without the TV, that's all he was buying. He was not buying an actual product in terms of an in-ring component, in terms of a show he was going to have to produce. He was going to do that. He was going to have to do that under his own dime, on his own network deal. Um, so I'm not sure how successful it would have been because would they have had a television deal? Furthermore, you know, this is Bischoff that kind of helped run WCW into the ground. So who's to say that new look and new direction would have done anything better? It might have been even worse. Something we always got to think about, you know, Look at the full context of something. Davon Solo Rager Evans, do you think wrestlers fart while in the ring? Uh, 
probably like you do at work, I would imagine, um, oh, they fart in there all the time. I mean, think about it. If I'm a wrestler, I'm going to be ripping ass every chance I can get. There's going to be one big ass-ripping contest. You know, who can outstink the other? Oh, you're going to call a spot? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how my ass tastes. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> they do that shit all the time and they know it, intentional or otherwise. Uh, let's see here. Jason Chin's asking me about CM Punk podcast interview, as I said. Um, just uh, stay tuned. Uh, Brandon Akins, do you remember the Beaver Cleavage gimmick from the WWF in 1999? Kind of. Beaver Cleavage. <laughs> <laughs> Danny Palmer, what type of gimmick change would you give John Cena? Uh, one where he lost sometimes. One where he actually has a story to his character and a story to the stories that he's actually involved in. You know, I try to change up his gimmick a little bit just in the sense of not being such a walking billboard for his own merchandise. Um, didn't necessarily mean I'd have to turn him heel, because he already is one, in a sense. Uh, but there are things I would do to freshen them up. Because I don't even care what the positive spin meisters want to say. You are getting a diminishing return on John Cena. It's reflected in several aspects of the business. The longer you continue to go down the same path with him, the larger the diminishing return increases. Talked about this for a few years now, and it only grows bigger by the day. You must change up something at some point in time. Because it will get to a point where you will get very little to no return from the John Cena character being done the same, still the same, same way. Uh, Nadim Durrani, should Kamala be inducted into the Hall of Fame? Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't see why not. Kamala was a guy that had a name. See, more important than Coco Beware, probably. So yeah, I put him in. Um, let's see here, Keith Weber. Who is Hulk Hogan's best opponent that beat him clean? Uh, beat him clean, probably the Rock at WrestleMania 18. Uh, Kurt Angle beat him clean. Uh, if I remember correctly, didn't Chris Jericho beat him clean? Brock Lesnar beat him clean. Uh, Ultimate Warrior WrestleMania 6 beat him clean. This whole notion that Hulk Hogan never put over anybody, never put anybody over clean. You know, you, you compare him to John Cena actually with both guys at the top in different companies, you could actually make an argument that Hogan put over more guys 100% clean, no bullshit, no excuses, no anything made up about it. Than John Cena has. Think about that for a second. Just really think about that. Because anytime John Cena loses, there's always an excuse. There's always some bullshit involved with it. Uh, let's see here. Creighton Reed, Fuck Mary Kill, Lisa Turtle from Saved by the Bell, Laura Winslow from Family Matters, and Naomi. Um, Lisa Turtle back in the late 80s, early 90s, or Lisa Turtle now? She doesn't look so good like Voorhees, does it? Um, let's see here. I'd probably have to fuck Lisa Turtle from back in the day. I'd have to marry Laura Winslow, and I'd probably have to kill Naomi. I'm sorry, but this shit goes back to when I was a kid. I mean, these were the sisters that were giving me chubbers 25 years ago. I got to go with that history, damn it. Be like reliving the childhood as a man. Uh, let's see here. Benedict Infinity Ward. How awesome is Colt Cabana? Uh, I don't know how you defined how awesome, but I like Colt. I think Colt is good people. You know, every interaction I've ever had personally with Colt has always been very positive and left a relatively good impression in my um, mind about him. Uh, he's somebody I respect. He's somebody that I like. I like his work. Um, you know, so I don't have any issues with Colt Cabana whatsoever. I always felt that uh, ROH dropped the ball with Colt. I felt TNA dropped the ball by not bringing Colt in. I felt WWE dropped the ball some by not bringing in Colt to be a commentator. Uh, I think he's somebody, I know in some certain ways he tries to spin it maybe that he likes being that kind of real freelancer, that independent contractor. He actually lives up to it, but, you know, money talks and bullshit walks. He can talk about that studio apartment in Chicago all the time he fucking wants to, but I'm just being realistic here. I rent a three-bedroom, two-bath house, and he lives in a studio apartment in a um, crime-ridden city. You'd have to think if he had the opportunity to make money and a lot more money, he would want to jump on that chance again. And I think he should have already gotten that opportunity. I think he should have been brought in back in 2011 when the whole shit with CM Punk was going down. He should have been brought in at that time. You know, Colt Cabana could at least be a decent mid-cards guy in the WWE. I firmly believe that. I think TNA's really dropped the ball not bringing him in. I thought ROH dropped the ball and how they utilized him and how they just kind of let him go. 
my opinion. Joel Rivera, do you think Booker T gets overshadowed during the batch at the beach incident? Sure, because nobody ever fucking talks about it. It's always about J Jared Russo and Hogan. People forget all about fucking Booker T. All right. See your Benedict Infinity Ward asked me a question about CM Punk in the podcast, so you already know what I'm going to say there. Uh, Joel Rivera, Daniel Style Joe was the TNA's only five-star match in Unbreakable 2005. Could that match with the characters and storylines have worked in WWE and still been five stars? When you get into the star ratings, again, it's incredibly subjective. You have to be careful. I mean, is there a set guide of what makes five stars? Because to me, five stars is the best of the very best. It is the creme de la creme. And far too often, I see far too many unqualified, frankly, reviewers giving matches four and four and a half stars when I'm like, most of the matches weren't even that good, let alone to be calling them that damn good or, you know, borderline great. I mean, we should be saving five star matches for the truly best of the truly best. Like, if you look at it from a, let's say, WrestleMania standpoint, you know, to me, what would fit into that five-star match category might be an Undertaker Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 25 because of all the components that it had in it and all the things that occurred during that match, the story that was told, what have you. I just don't know if you can have just a five-star match based off of in-ring action alone. Not saying there wasn't a story with Daniel Styles, Joe, but, again, is that really five-star it's one of those legendary TNA matches, though. It's definitely one of the best matches in the company's history. I have no qualms about that. I guess if you're going to say a TNA match maybe fit into that five-star category, that might be it. Um, but would it have worked in WWE and still been five stars? I don't know. Maybe there would have been a better story heading into it. Maybe there would have been a worse story or no story heading into it at all. Joe, Gu Joe Gutfield, of the big four pay-per-views, which one is your favorite? Uh, used to be my favorite gimmick pay-per-view was actually Survivor Series. Um, WrestleMania is still the king. So, I guess maybe Royal Rumble because it is its own unique kind of deal. And, you know, it sets the table for WrestleMania. It tries to get you launching into the new wrestling year in a big way. So, yeah. Um, let's see here. Joshua Pleasant Jr., why didn't Booker T get fired when he said the N-word on television? I don't know. I guess it'd be kind of similar to, uh, if a white person said, you know, Hulk Hogan, I'm coming for you, cracker! You know, or if you had a tag team that was calling themselves the Honky Haters and they were two white guys. Well, you probably could view it as self-deprecating. Uh, maybe it was the fact that the people involved with WCW at the time like that. They're like, yeah! You tell them, Booker! Use that word! Oh, wait, Hogan's white. Well, he's tan. That's close enough. Call him that! He's an man all day! Probably what they were on. I don't know. Probably liked it. Probably didn't care because the Booker spot on the card with Harlan Heat at the time. I don't really know. That's a good question. Ben Scott or Alshon Jeffrey, Brandon Marshall, overrated receivers, and while Cutler is the obvious problem in the offense for the Bears, do you think they also contribute to the lack of offense? Well, they were part of the offense, so they are a part of the problem. Alshon is a very, very talented individual, and he's got that thing you can't coach that size. And he has huge hands, great height, leaping ability. But he's too inconsistent. You know, and sometimes having great height and leaping ability is not necessarily a skill. It's just what you can do. It's just who you are. Uh, his route tree is very limited. Um, he's inconsistent with his hands. He disappears for too many big stretches of games. And Brandon Marshall, you know, now we're talking about a guy that's entering his, his – he's 30 now. Um, so you might start to see some decline in his game. Uh, they play a part. Now, it doesn't help that they have a quarterback that completely sucks and just totally, totally – fails to grasp the concept of going through progressions and on a so on and so forth on a consistent basis. Uh, they play a part, but as I talked about the Bears before the 2014 draft and their need for a real quick twitch Randall Cobb, T.Y. Hilton type of wide receiver out of the slot, uh, of course they didn't get it. So what happens is, is if you could take away either Marshall or Jeffrey on the outside, you basically leave them with Jeffrey or Marshall deep or over the middle, Martellus Bennett over the middle and Matt Forte short. There's not that quick twitch guy, that smaller guy that can do a bunch of different things and make defenses have to be stretched out vertically and horizontally. And that's a big problem with the Bears offense, frankly. Um, so, yeah. Luke Wynn Staley, would you rather watch a two-hour Jeff Jarrett promo or rim China for 10 minutes? Probably got to pick the promo. Although if you rim China's butt, would that be like being touched by God? Hmm. 